This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. The Commanders, a new book from Professor Lloyd Clark, Director of Research at the Center for Army Leadership at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, as well as Professorial Research Fellow in War Studies at Humanities Research Institute, University of Buckingham. We address once upon a time, men born in the 19th century who dominated the story, the tragedy of the sec first and second war, the great war and its follow the second war in the 20th century. And now the professor using these examples and this detailed research is looking for the mystery of leadership once solved in the 19th and the 20th and here we are in the 21st, always leadership. Professor, Congratulations and good evening. Your book is a treat for me because you put these three men, George Patton, Bernard Montgomery, and Erwin Rommel against each other's styles and schooling and uh, the accidents of history. But at the same time, very economically, they come together on the world stage, not once, not twice, but thrice uh, over the first half of the second of the 20th century. So we begin with George Patton. The reigning detail about George Patton is that he was born into a well-to-do family and he never forgot it. Does that dominate stories about George Patton's youth, that he was well-to-do? Yes, I think he recognized that he was a very privileged individual. Um, his family upbringing, his education, um, his sports and pastimes all gave him a sense that he was privileged and perhaps destined for, for great things. And I think that played out throughout his young life and indeed through his career. Yes, and he spent an idyllic childhood and then off to West Point, where suddenly he's defiant, he's rebellious, he's troublesome. Was that always there or did it emerge because of the discord he felt being with men, young men who were not as privileged as he is? Where did it come from? I think it's um, George Patton's first real relationship um, with people outside his own class. And he began to recognize perhaps for the first time that he wasn't the brightest young man in the United States of America, that there were different points of view, not all of which he agreed with. And he also began to think that maybe, just maybe, there was a possibility that he wasn't quite as bright as he once thought he was. Uh, and he found it very difficult to make meaningful relationships with his fellows at, at West Point. He was very much a, a loner, um, very much a man that pulled on his rank, such as it was um, at West Point, um, and felt that if he could be authoritative through military means, it would overcome some of the deficiencies perhaps that he had in character. And certainly his fellows um, in his class reacted quite badly to that. He graduated in the middle of his class in 1909. At this point, he has a dream to be a general by 30, which is fantastically unrealistic in an army that their ranks were very slow. Where did he come up with the idea that he was going to be a general? Is that his family? I think it is partly his family. He his family had a long military tradition. And I think that, that Patton was always a person that needed to set himself goals, no matter how unachievable they may be. Something that, that pushed him towards a certain outcome, uh, whether that was to be a general by the time he was 30, uh, to die a hero on the battlefield, whatever it might be. Uh, he he con consistently set himself those targets throughout his career. Uh, sometimes he made them, Sometimes he didn't, but in terms of his career progression, um, it was pretty slow. And certainly he wasn't a general by the age of 30, nothing like it. The theme here is leadership. We go to Bernard Montgomery, born in London in 1887. Significantly, he's a preacher's kid. He never forgets it. And his father was a successful uh, preacher of the Lord. And his mother was a disciplinarian. That is Bernard Montgomery, Professor. It is, in a nutshell. Um, there's a, an old question as to whether leaders are, are born or made. Um, I think most certainly we see with Bernard Montgomery's upbringing that um, the influence of his parents was, was huge. He wasn't overtly religious. Um, he wasn't a great churchgoer 
in, in that sort of sense, but he had great faith. He was spiritual and he certainly um, always followed the, the lessons of the Bible and he, he was indeed evangelical in some of his leadership methods. Um, and what we see with his parents are the work ethic that comes from his father and um, the coldness, the aloofness, the disciplinarian traits that he gets from his mother. And that really does follow Monty right the way through to the end of his life. A strange detail. He goes to St. Paul's and we'll come back to St. Paul's when we get to the big war in 44. But his parents decide he's not quite the scholar or something was very strange and decided Sandhurst for him. Uh, and the choice of Sandhurst in 19, in the early, first part of this 20th century, was that a significant choice for a family, uh, committing your son to Sandhurst? It, it certainly was. Um, there's often um, a case with families in the United Kingdom um, prior to the First World War. With what are they going to do with their sons? How are they going to make their way in the world? Sandhurst was always a very good option, perhaps for those that weren't the brightest in the family, didn't have any great interest in commerce or indeed going into the church. And certainly Montgomery wasn't the brightest in his class, far, far from it. He joined a class at St Paul's that congregated together all of those that had the intellectual ability that was seen to be required by the army at that point, which wasn't particularly high. And therefore, Montgomery entered Sandhurst, not as one perhaps that was the, um, the intellectual weakness in the link at Sandhurst, but actually one who was amongst common fellows intellectually. He was, he was one of many. And therefore, his experience um, in becoming an officer through an academy was somewhat different to Patton's. Uh, Patton felt that he was perhaps the least intelligent. Montgomery felt certainly with his sporting ability and military understanding the, the keys to leadership that in fact he could hold his own. Yes, focus, 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 and intense focus for Bernard Montgomery. He graduates and he's sent off to the British Empire, which is the subcontinent, Peshawar, as a junior leader. And he's learning now how to lead. There will be a theme that emerges in Montgomery's life, which is that he's unpopular with his peers. Did that show up in this first posting to the Royal Warwickshires? Yeah, I think it, I think it did. Um, we've got to remember that at this time, leaders were seen very much as born, that they came um, to the army with the inherent traits and requirements that leaders required in the army and indeed for Britain in the British Empire. But when Montgomery comes up against the working class soldier, again, it's his first real um, relationship with such men. He finds that um, he's got to change his style. He's got to actually try to better understand the men that he is leading and in a sense, serving. And they didn't at first like his attitude, his arrogance, his superior knowledge of the army, when in fact he was very new to it. And so gradually he had to come to understand that context was everything, knowing one's soldiers was key, and he developed that skill. By 1912, he's back home, and everyone's aware there's tension on the continent. Uh, the quote the professor provides, Bernard Montgomery committed himself to unending pursuit of clarity and ruthless self-discipline. Erwin Rommel, the youngest of the three generals, born in 1891, his parents were teachers, and he has the discipline of a lecturer at the same time. He was a very brave man, very recklessly brave man. He joins the 124th Württemberg Regiment. What is the significance of that at the time in Germany? Well, at the time, uh, Germany's made up of various principalities, and the southern German states, the Württemberg state, was about as far removed from Prussia, the dominant military and political force, as one could get, both in terms of um, its importance, one might say, politically to Germany, but also its location. And therefore, right from the outset, he was a bit of an outsider. And um, I think that that plays both on his mind as he joins the army, uh, but also has an impact on his approach to his military career. I'm speaking with Professor Lloyd Clark. 
Director of Research at the Center for Army Leadership at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. We're looking at the theme of leadership through the lives and, and battles of three major generals from the 20th century. We go to Patton at war, but surprisingly not at war in the Great War on Europe. You will remember that the U.S. did not enter that war until 1917. However, Patton in 1916 found his way onto the expeditionary force led by John Pershing into Mexico. What's striking about this with all the time they had on their hands is that Patton wound up making what he called an a, 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 a vehicle attack on one of Pancho Villa's lieutenants, Julio Cardenas. And surprising to me, Professor, at this point, Patton has this imagination that I'm going to be a hero. And he kills the man. He shoots him dead. He launches the attack. Did, did the death in any way show up in his writing to his parents at this time? Did, did he pause about it? Shooting a man is different than imagining it. I don't think um, it preyed on his mind at all. Um, this is a man who, from his first days in the army, sought action, sought to be a hero, and was willing to do whatever it took to be successful, however that might be defined. Uh, and just getting onto the um, expedition to Mexico, he was not backwards in coming forwards. He was always innovating. He was always pushing the boundaries. And therefore, he recognized that he would have to take risks and that if warfare was about anything, it was about defeating the enemy. And if therefore somebody got in his way and he had to kill him, that was the, just the price that people paid. And he was willing to be the uh, person that pulled the trigger when it was required. And he gained, uh, he gained fame at this moment, at least in the newspapers. He was dubbed the bandit killer. He was also someone already preaching cavalry tactics, which I write down as mobility, boldness, and aggression. They haven't invented the tank yet, but he's already talking like a tank commander. Yes, absolutely. It seems to be that uh, the tank was just waiting for him to, to embrace. He was a man that really understood the power of the media right from the outset, um, tried to put himself in the spotlight. So when an opportunity arose, he could exploit it ruthlessly, uh, as he was eventually to do with the tanks. August 1914, Bernard Montgomery is deployed with the Royal Warwickshires. He's an adjutant in the 1st Battalion of the 4th Division, the 18th Brigade. They're deployed against what they believe will be a short war, because Germany is overwhelmed with enemies on the east and west. However, the Germans, as we know, make the dash towards Paris and overwhelm the BEF. What remains of the BEF as it's fractured by the German advance and the French inability to hold it until, too, until just in time. However, what's significant here is that Bernard Montgomery is a brave young man who leads his platoon with his sword waving, completely out of date, a sword waving against troops that are armed with automatic weapons. And he shot, is this when he shot in the chest, Professor, the, the lung wound? That's and right. get shot again in the leg, and he's left out there in no man's land, a wo badly wounded. What what are his thoughts in, that he writes down about that time out there when he was neither alive nor dead, sort of in between the worlds? His world was a very confused world during that period. He certainly felt that he was going to die, but he also felt that he would die having let down his comrades because undoubtedly they would be a lesser organization without Bernard Montgomery at the helm. And although we might sort of say that sword waving was um, out of date at the time, I suppose what all of these um, leaders in 1914 felt is, how can I inspire my men to follow me? How can I give them faith? How can I give them leadership? And they would do whatever it took, even if it meant putting themselves in harm's way. And that's exactly what um, Montgomery did. And he nearly lost his life doing so. I'm struck by the irony that he now, because of the wound, has difficulty breathing. And so he's given staffing jobs. It saved his life, Professor. So many of those young men didn't survive the next wave and the next wave and the next wave. 
and the staff work was exactly exactly what his temperament needed. He was a man who worked ceaselessly. I, I imagine he slept at his desk. Are there any stories about that? <laughs> you're, you're quite right. This is exactly what Montgomery needed. And I suppose if one looks back with hindsight, what Britain needed, it needed a Montgomery that was alive. Um, and he could show all of his professional knowledge and expertise behind the desk. But even when he was behind a desk, and I think this is so important, one is still leading when you're a staff officer in an army. You have still got to lead from that desk. The way that Montgomery did it was to make sure that um, he worked extremely hard and got out to see the troops. He worked extraordinarily long hours. So I have to say, I don't recall whether he fell asleep at his desk, but I would have thought he probably did. I can just imagine him having been out in, in the trenches, the explosions raging around him, um, having a cup of tea with his men, going back and writing his reports and falling exhausted across his papers. That's absolutely the sort of thing that Monty would do. Also, I'm struck by the fact that he summed up the whole first war and what the problem was for the, the BEF and everyone else, leadership. He summed it all up at 30 years old. He's, that was his life's mission. Quite so. Uh, leadership underpins everything that an army does. And I suppose one could say the same for business. If you've got leadership wrong, there are many other things that will go wrong. Get leadership right and you're beginning to get the fundamentals to be successful. Montgomery understood that. It doesn't matter about the tactics and the machinery and the technology. If you don't have people that lead properly in the right way, it's very unlikely that an army is going to be successful. Erwin Rommel also in heavy combat, first in the Ardennes, first war now, first in the Ardennes and then later in the Transylvania Mountains in Romania. What is striking about his leadership style is that he takes enormous risks, risks more than he asks his men to take. He's a hands-on leader. It wins him Iron Cross second class, Iron Cross first class. But I thought of this as uh, micromanaging. That's what we talk, talk about it today. Was he criticized for it, Professor? Most definitely. Um, the um, units that he commanded um, were very much with um, his own personality in mind. He asked people to do only what he would do. And he demanded that they take risks, that they um, fight hard, that they fight to the death in a way that perhaps other commanders would not. And he was involved in the minutiae. He got a grip of the, of the detail. And I think by modern standards, we would say that that is micromanagement. Although one would say perhaps during the First World War, it's exactly what those troops required when fighting in such harsh conditions. They needed a role model. And Rommel was most certainly that great role model that they could follow in any conditions. The book is The Commanders, The Leadership Journeys of George Patton, Bernard Montgomery, and Erwin Rommel. Lloyd Clark is the author. We go now to George Patton. George Patton is part of an army that does not proceed to France immediately in 1914. The bloodletting is appalling. In 1917, it is the decision of the president, Mr. Wilson, and Congress to commit the U.S. to the war. And therefore, Patton needs to find a way to the battle. He wants to fight. He wants to be a general. And he believes war will make him a general. So he appeals to Pershing to take him along in June of 17, which is a year before the U.S. really gets into the fight. The spring of 18 is when the U.S. fights. But he goes off as imagining himself as a hero. And herein, Professor is striking. I have a note here that Patton... Uh, uh, publishes or uh, writes up brief notes on the Army Regiment of, ta of Tanks. They're early on now, he in 1916, 1917, the tank has been invented by the British Army. And Patton is suddenly steered into thinking about it. Is it comfortable for him? He, he is a, a horseman and a cavalryman by trade. I think it is difficult for him as a cavalryman, but not difficult for him as a professional. He recognized that change endures and that maybe the day of the horse cavalry had passed and that the future was mechanized warfare. But he had to tread obviously a very careful line when peddling that 
that sort of an argument. Um, certainly his family, his regimental family, would react very badly against that, even if the army more generally could see the merits in his argument. Uh, but gradually we see him play that out very, very carefully and very successfully. Now, economy of scene, Professor, can't make this stuff up. Battle of Samahil, which is the first effort of Pershing to take the, uh, the uh, uh, AEF into battle as a whole and not have it pulled apart. Uh, the battle bogs down and he runs into a, another officer from the 42nd Rainbow. In order to get the attack moving, they both take great risks. And the other officer is Douglas MacArthur. When I read that, I thought you're making this up, Professor. <laughs> it is a remarkable coincidence. Um, and yeah, uh, when I first um, read that in some documents, I did have to do a double take just to ensure that it was the same Douglas MacArthur. And of course it was these two remarkable 20th century future generals meeting on the same battlefield at the same time and doing the same job of leadership, you know, uh, leading from the front whilst their men are hunkered down and frightened. These men are out there, the bullets zipping around their ears trying to ensure that their men push forward and take the objective. It's absolutely um, in, within their character. The, the battle that, uh, that fells Patton is Ardennes. And he comes to a point where he realizes he's surrounded, his men are cut up, he's led a charge by himself into the battlefield despite being told not to get involved as a commanding officer. He thinks time for another Patton to die and he doesn't die. His life is saved by a man named Joe Angelo, his Batman, who believes that Patton's gone crazy. Did he? Did he go crazy at that moment? His conduct is, is so reckless. Do we know? I don't think he went, he went crazy, but I would imagine that there was this blur of activity. And whereas most of us might think self-preservation, um, let's find some sort of sanctuary here, some safety. I think that Patton felt, well, this is my chance. This is my destiny. Let's see what destiny brings me. The fact that he wasn't killed, he was only quite badly wounded, which itself could have led to his death, is almost by, by the way. Patton would very happily have died on that battlefield. And he often refers to it later in life when in moments of desperation and um, in black moods, he said, I should have died on that 1918 battlefield. That was my destiny. Where I am now is nothing compared to that. Uh, staffing for Bernard Montgomery, 104th Brigade. He's described as aloof, a hard worker, detailed, has talent. I'm struck by that he starts writing instructions for training of divisions for offensive action. And the big one, lessons learned in operations undertaken, a summary of the war and what went wrong. So already he's, he's addressing his understanding of the world. And significantly, he doesn't enjoy debate. When he writes it down, it's fixed. Is that correct, Professor? Very much the case. Um, there was the wrong way and there was the Montgomery way. Um, and he was very keen to ensure that his view um, gained the credibility that he would say that it deserved through publication. Now, he could talk in the messes and people might call him a bore, but he was also a prolific publisher of, of articles and let go. As, as a lecturer as well. He was always passing on his views. It is something that helped him gain confidence in his professionalism and got the name Montgomery, Burn Montgomery out there into the wider army and it served him well. Erwin Rommel, again, an extremely brave man, recklessly brave. And yet I write down, he was venerated, not loved by his troops. He believes he was inspiring them with his own example. There are many times he could have been shot down and we would have never heard of it. I think that that phrase venerated by but not loved would be equally applicable to Montgomery and Patton as well, certainly at, at this time in their careers. All of these men were taking extraordinary risks to themselves and demanding huge sacrifice of their men. The fact that they as leaders weren't killed is just very fortunate for them, but there were plenty of men that were dying all around them or suffered terrible wounds, or died of their wounds. Um, and as a result of that, their men had great respect for them, particularly I would say for Rommel and his bravery and his professionalism, but they found him very difficult to connect with as a human being. 
After the war, Patton is returned to America, and he and Eisenhower, who have become colleagues at this point, are campaigning for the tank, for new tactics, uh, put away the cavalry, look at the new world and battles we fought there. But it's exceedingly rejected by the high command, and they both amend their ways. Although, again, is this Patton showing his rebellious side? Because Eisenhower is a game, is a team player. I think it is Patton showing his rebellious side. And again, it shows a man that's willing to take risks. He perceived what the future held, and it was a, a future of armor. It was a future of modern technology in which he could see himself playing an important part. Um, but as we've already said, um, he was a cavalryman. Um, he had grown up in the age of the horse and of the sword, and he found that very difficult to, to leave behind. Um, but he certainly was a great advocate of the tank, but he had to tread very carefully for his own career prospects. He was well-to-do, and he married Beatrice, who was also well-to-do, and they displayed their wealth when stationed near Washington by buying a house, fox hunting, yacht, polo. And uh, at this point, Patton had behavior conduct that was remarkably out of step. He was regarded as drinking too much, a playboy, and became depressed, and that's in his letters. But we need to go to Bernard Montgomery, who, to my knowledge, was never depressed. The amazing confidence that Bernard Montgomery had as a, as a field commander, he had early on as a brigade major. In fact, I think someone described him as having missionary zeal, which I take it wasn't meant as a compliment, but certainly describes his, his character. He's assigned to the Territorial Army. What was that, Professor? Why was that a significant assignment? They weren't professional soldiers. They were what they would have called themselves at that time, weekend soldiers, reservists, if you will. And he also meets or takes a friendship with a man who's the husband of his sister, Freddy Guignant. I try to do the best I can with the French pronunciation, but in any event, Freddy will be critical to him until he loses him in combat in the Second War. That's right. Uh, Freddy de Guingan was um, somebody who Montgomery had picked out as a young officer of great potential. Um, and he managed to pick him out because Montgomery, in his own time, after he had done his day's work, used to run courses for junior officers to help them pass the examinations for staff college, which would then open up the army to them for higher rank. Freddie was one of those students, they immediately hit it off, and it was a relationship that eventually was going to serve the British Army and the country extremely well in the Second World War. Yes, I learned from the professor that critical to all three men were their chiefs of staff, and Freddie de Guignan will become chief of staff until he falls. Rommel goes through the disruptions caused in Germany, the revolutions caused in Germany. First, he and eventually joins the Weimar Republic's army, the Reichswehr, which is limited. He marries very well Lucy from the first war, and Lucy is his anchor. He does the best he can training his regiments, but these are hard times. And I go to the fact that in October of 1929, he's a lecturer at the Dresden Infantry School. Was he regarded as an inspirational lecture? How do they remember it? He, he was inspirational. Um, this is a man that could um, walk the walk, as they say, as well as talk the talk. He was not somebody that had just um, cropped up from a staff position. This is a man that had won the highest honours for gallantry during the First World War, and he had commanded men, led men in the most exacting of circumstances. But he also had that ability to inspire men in the classroom. Very few people can do that, can translate their experiences on the battlefield and bring them to life in the classroom, but a whole generation of officers were inspired in the classroom by Erwin Rommel. And there was never a bad word said about his teaching. He was inspirational, pure and simple. Ba Patton, again, is admired by his peers as a war commander, but he's also a man who makes strange choices that are easily judged. The Bonus Army, 1932, Patton leads an attack on four men, veterans who wanted some substance from the promises made to them in the first war, and they marched on Washington. It was hardly on an armed camp. 
but Patton launches his cavalry, third cavalry regiment against them and is there when the uh, uh, Hooverville is set on fire. It's an appalling episode in American history. What I'm struck by is the note that Joe Angelo, who saved his life, Patton denies him. It, it reminded me very much of a character test that Patton fails again and again. He does what is convenient for him, not what is honorable. I absolutely agree with that. We've got to remember that the um, chief of the army staff who was commanding this particular action, the American army against its own veterans, was Douglas MacArthur. And both of these men were using the opportunity to assert themselves in ways that I find quite remarkable, in many cases despicable. The sort of methods that we used against the bonus marchers were, were beyond what I would deem to be acceptable. And I, I find it incredible that, um, that Patton could, could carry out those orders with such zeal. And then, of course, um, I think that the illustration that you've given of Joe D'Angelo uh, being rejected by Patton, the man that had saved his life, just, just proves what a, a cad Patton could often be. George Mac uh, Bernard Montgomery, however, does extremely well as a teacher, and he ri he travels widely as um, a a, in the Royal Warwickshire. So there's Palestine, there's Egypt, there's India. This is an empire, and we're following the British Empire with the British Army. He's a man who inspires people, but he's again not liked. He's not popular. He must make the him he must make the the test of truth. He talks about the test of truth. Eventually, he'll be in Palestine in October of 38 as a major general. He knows war is coming. Is that correct, Professor? The army could feel it. They were ready for it. Yes, and, and he was ready for it. He, he didn't deny that war was coming when a lot of his contemporaries felt that peace was always possible. Montgomery was always saying that might be the case, but let's prepare for war. And he was always preparing for war, even during long periods of peace. He said that his job as an officer and a leader was to get the army and his men ready to fight the next conflict. And nothing was allowed to get in the way of that. I'm speaking to Professor Lloyd Clark. The book is The Commanders, The Leadership Journey of George Patton, Bernard Montgomery and Erwin Rommel. When we come back, Rommel and Hitler. The course for Erwin Rommel is is deeply compromised by the rise of the National Socialists, the Nazis. And it is surprising to learn that right away, Rommel establishes what you'd have to say is a manipulative relationship with the Fuhrer, with Adolf Hitler. And he goes through periods of admiring him and not admiring him, being punished by him and not, admire, not being punished by him. Professor, this is the strangest part because once you associate uh, Rama with Hitler, he's not the quite he's not the same inspirational figure he was before. Uh, it's it's troubling only because it's impossible to remove the fact that he would have known of the remarks that the that Hitler said uh, repeated again and again, treating human beings as worthy of being destroyed, particularly the Jews, but many more people than that. Did Rama reflect on that in his letters to Lucy, the anti-Semitism? Did he talk about it? No, I think he, he tended to gloss over what we might, might describe as the most extreme excesses of, of Hitler's politics and personality. And as you say, he, he had this love-hate relationship with, with, with Hitler. Um, there were very few people, if any, that, that Rommel venerated more in his career. Uh, most of the um, admiration that uh, Rommel shows for anyone in a superior position to his own is directed wholly towards Hitler. Uh, his leadership, what he is perhaps um, pro providing Germany with to become a world-class power again. When he falls out of love with Hitler, it, it's not really for his politics, which as I say, he glosses over. It's because he has let the army down or let Rommel down. It's about trust. And whenever Hitler was untrustworthy, Rommel deems this to be a negative point against the Fuhrer. And the longer the Second World War goes on, the more those negative points seem to add up to quite a lot for Rommel. 
In August of 39, my note here says, Rommel attends the Führerhauptkartier. That's the command bunker for, uh, for Hitler in the invasion of Poland. He's there for the evening briefings every day. And then he is assigned to command Hitler's personal entourage, the security forum with SS squads. I immediately got anxious about the SS presence. What was his, what did, what Rommel make of the SS and their mission to destroy humans? I don't think he liked the SS. I don't think he liked what they stood for or their politics or the way they went about their business and the way that they tried to usurp the, the army. He saw them largely as thugs, but thugs that had to be endured because they were part of the system and therefore had to um, be put in their place when they could be and um, reconciled with his own ambitions when necessary. So certainly not a supporter, but then Rommel isn't a man that um, particularly stands up against the Nazi regime until perhaps um, later in 1944. Um, so I think he was at best ambivalent towards the Nazis and the SS. And we speak of uh, Rommel now as a field commander, but these moments of speaking with Hitler, he's a Swabian, not a Prussian. They, know, they always made that distinction. He avoided the, general, the command college that he was invited to. You, make a, uh, you, you emphasize the fact that he wanted to stay with the men. Is he disregarded by the Prussians? Are the Prussians envious, jealous, competitive with him? How do they regard his closeness as Swabian who is not born to lead that close to the Fuhrer? All of those things, John, I think. Um, he was from the wrong class. He was from the wrong part of the country. Um, he hadn't been to the best military schools. He wasn't a part of the general staff. Um, along with many of the Prussian aristocrats that aspired to senior rank. And of course, he allied himself with the Fuhrer, who himself was an outsider, was a man of low birth, of um, poor behaviours and bad manners. Um, but there was that connection there possibly between the Fuhrer and, and Rommel because of that. They were both outsiders and they were both fighting against what they felt was the pernicious influence of the Prussians within the army. And that connection was strong. Finally, he wrote a book called Infantry, Infantry Attacks, 1937. It sold in the millions. There may be, they said Hitler read it. Is that when he became a national personality? That book, Professor, we have 30 seconds. Yes, I, I think most definitely it is. It actually elevated him out of the ordinary, another officer trying to make his way into the great professional that could use the lessons of Germany's past for the benefit of the future. Professor Lloyd Clark, The Commanders, The Leadership Journey of George Patton, Bernard Montgomery, and Erwin Rommel, three men on the eve of the catastrophe itself, the war. And the theme of this book is leadership. How did they prepare themselves? How did they conduct themselves as leaders in, to say it's a life and death struggle, it's the planet. It's at risk here. We go to war with George Patton by going to exercises. Professor, the US again does not enter into the war for some time. The attack by the Nazis in September of 39 and Britain and France are all in a full in the war. So is Russia, except for it's not an adversary of Berlin yet. It's just bullying the Poles or, and mistreating people in the East. However, George Patton, knows there's a war coming, and so does the command, the command of the U.S. Army. George Marshall will emerge as the commander of the army. There are exercises in Louisiana, Tennessee, and the Carolinas in 1940 and 41. At this point, did the army know the tank was going to be a major factor? Had they accepted it, Professor? I think that this was the period during which all of the new ideas about armoured warfare were coming to a head and had these exercises been a complete failure we may have looked at a different US relationship with armoured forces but as it is partly because of the influence of, of Patton and his peers um, they are a great success they just show what bold leadership and new technology when combined can achieve.
and the exercises, Patton cries out for discipline. He wants smart soldiers. He wants uh, soldiers to take initiative. He also lectures, although I don't get the sense that he's, a, he's an academic like Montgomery or he's an inspirational talker like, like the quiet and reserved but explosive Rommel. How is he described by his, not, not just his peers, but by his subordinates as a man who presents facts? I think that um, there was not a lot of trust between, um, uh, between Patton's audiences um, and him as a speaker. Uh, Patton used to take um, various subjects about which the um, audience might know very little. A, Ro a Roman general, for example, um, and go into very great detail about the command and leadership qualities of that individual. And quite frankly, he would bore everyone. Uh, Rommel and Bernard Montgomery, um, in contrast, would very much play to their audience. They would pick their subjects carefully, make a connection and inspire them through their carefully chosen subjects. Patton never really did that. He spoke about what he wanted to speak about. Yes, you have one lecture entitled Great Leaders in History. There is that concern. It shows up once or twice in your book of Patton telling people, I presume when he's fox hunting and drinking afterwards, that he's lived many lives and he's fought with Caesar and he's fought with Alexander. What did his peers make of that? Uh, him being imaginative, poetic, it's suggestively dysfunctional. Yes, I would agree. Um, I think that around the dining room table at a dinner party, friends and family might say, well, that's just Patton being Patton. Georgie's always like that. But when he expresses the idea that he is the reincarnation of Napoleon Bonaparte, and he says that in the officer's mess or to a, a group of grizzled veterans and um, uh, 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 and junior soldiers, they can't find any connection with this man at all. And particularly when he says it's his destiny to die on a battlefield, well, they say, well, please go ahead and do that, but don't include us. Yes, there are other things about Patton. I've mentioned his drinking. He's also a, you know, a vulgar speaker in polite company. It's odd. It's all very strange. But we go to Montgomery, who's nothing but a gentleman at all times, although an unpopular gentleman, and he doesn't care. He has protectors, however, and I'm struck by this because after the defeated uh, Dunkirk, uh, well, let's do the defeated Dunkirk first, because at this point, he becomes the centerpiece of saving the British expeditionary force and what they can of the French army and the Belgian army. He commands the third infantry division, and he's trained them for the fight during what was called the, the what they call it, the, the seats creek, sets creek, where everybody sat down after the attack on Poland and there wasn't anything else until May, mid-May of 1940, uh, 1940. And he trains his division endlessly. Did they appreciate why he was doing this? I think at first they didn't. We've got to remember that Montgomery becomes the commander of the third division, the principal British fighting division, only just before the outbreak of hostilities. And they have had very little time to get to know their general officer. So by the time, just a couple of months later, they're sitting in, in France, um, waiting for the Germans to attack. They're wondering why this character, this quite aloof, fairly cold character, is making them work so hard when they think they've already got all of the answers, they know all of the tactics. And so they reacted initially quite badly, but eventually they got it because he formed a team through that hard work, through those exercises, through that training. 10 May, the Germans attack overwhelmingly. And the third division is part of the line to protect Brussels, but then it falls back, a very difficult maneuver to withdraw in contact with the enemy. And the fallback uh, sees its flanks disappear while the third division performs well, the flanks do not. And it turns out that Montgomery is charged, uh, sort of drafted to be the last of the divisions to exit from the beach. I have the note here that he left on June 1st, and I, I had a sense that he left reluctantly because there were still details for him to clean up. He's back in Britain now with the army in disarray totally. What was his thinking at this point? 
Uh, was it we're going to go, we're going to reorganize and go back and get him, or was he discouraged? Montgomery wasn't disheartened at all. He saw the disheveled British army back behind its fortress defences in the UK as a challenge. Uh, he wanted to rebuild the British army, not just so that it could continue the war, but so it could get into the front fort, be offensively minded, attack and to win the war. So he saw most of these problems purely within his remit, a challenge, a puzzle to be solved. And he now is in charge of the Southeastern Army. The expectation was the invasion was from Germany was coming that summer. It didn't come, but the Southeastern Army would have taken the brunt if there had been Operation Sea Lion and an invasion of the British Isles. The 7th Panzer Division is given to Erwin Rommel by the Prussians. And the idea here is we're going to attack them on May 10th. Remember, Montgomery's on the other side of the battlefield. We're crossing now to the German side. And the 7th Panzer Division is the first time, to my knowledge, that Rommel's commanded panzers. Is that correct? He'd been an infantryman to this point. That's right. He, he takes up the command of the 7th Panzer Division in February 1940. And he's been an infantry commander up to that point in his career. And now he's a major general commanding a panzer division to just about to launch an invasion of Belgium and France that is going to be one of the remar most remarkable in military history. And he does extremely well through that. Yes, he's aggressive, as you would expect. But at this point, he's also, for the first time that I was aware, disobedient, or let's put this way, I didn't hear that order, I'm attacking. He sees himself as the spear tip of the, of the invading force. And yet that worries his commanders because it exposes their flanks. The Germans were nowhere near confident that we believe they are in retrospect at this point, because the BEF and the French army and the conditions on the battlefield were to be solved in action. Uh, the, uh, the defenses of France were said to be adequate and therefore this route through the Ardennes uh, was a surprise to everyone. The roads, everything could have gone wrong. But Rommel is successful to the point that at the end, and Paris falls on the 14th of June, he's one of the, the celebrated ones. Now, the Nazi propaganda machine is taking up Rommel at this point, or was that already in place? Is this when they start to celebrate him in the newsreels? This is when they begin to celebrate him. He becomes Hitler's general. He becomes known as the commander of the phantom division, the man that is the personification of the German success, the man that takes risks, creates a psychological impact over the enemy and does remarkable things. And it's everything that Hitler could want of a general at this time. And the celebration now includes Rommel being a task to go to Libya, where the Italian forces allied with the Germans have been successful so far, but they are now being pressed by the British army pushing back. So next we're going to, with Rommel, the, now the Panzer Commander Rommel, to Libya in March of 41. Professor Lloyd Clark, the book is The Commanders, The Leadership Journeys of George Patton, Bernard Montgomery, and Erwin Rommel. All three men are about to meet in the battlefield of North Africa over the next two years. Rommel goes to North Africa in March of 41. He goes to Libya. But we're going to start with what we believe to be the successful rise of Bernard Montgomery's skill set as a trainer, as a lecturer, as a scholar of the battlefield, a man who pictures things in his mind before he gives the order. And he's not looking for debate. He's not looking for another method or committee work. This is a man who dictates. He he had a father who preached, and when he gets into the pulpit, this is the word of the Lord, and it is the word of Bernard Montgomery. So Bernard Montgomery is assigned to the Eighth Army, my note here, with uh, some expectation that he will be able to turn around what has been a catastrophe so far with the Germans and the Italians pushing them around. So in by January of 42 is my, my reading here. I'm going pretty fast. By January, of, uh, August of 42. Yeah, it's August, uh, January of 42. 
he takes up the Southeastern Command with 100,000, and then he's pushed to the Eighth Army, uh, which is in Cairo. He takes Freddie D. Gnon, his brother-in-law, with him. And everybody in the Eighth Army is curious about this man. What was his reputation before him when he joins North Africa? There was not much known about him in the wider army. Um, Alan Brooke, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, the head, the professional head of the British Army, is his great patron. And I think that Montgomery owes a great deal to him. Churchill was circumspect about Montgomery, believing that he didn't have the panache, the, the drive, the risk-taking requirements to turn the situation around. But eventually, because there was perhaps nobody else that was better situated, Montgomery got the job. And his task then was to not win over his superiors, but to win over Eighth Army, who were completely demoralized. Immediately, he starts planning an attack. Was that an order he was given by his superiors? Did Churchill say, I'm sending you out there to attack, or was that his idea? I think this is very much uh, Montgomery taking the reins of this um, rather demoralized horse and saying, right, let's give this one last go. Um, the previous incumbent might have been thinking about the defense of Cairo, but the best form of defense is attack. What we're going to do is we're going to spend a couple of months revitalizing ourselves, preparing to attack, and then we're going to push Rommel right the way back to Tunisia. Yes, and this is El Alamein, October of 1942. Uh, 900 guns, 1,000 tanks, everything gathered to attack the, the Germans and the Italians overwhelmingly and to keep it up. We note here that Rommel has been in North Africa for some time at this point and was given credit, the Africa Corps, as being the desert fox. However, importantly, Rommel is ill and he's undiagnosed ill, and it's debilitating. Uh, and they do they ever solve it? Do they ever figure out what's wrong with him? Because he goes on invalid leave several times. I think that he has high blood pressure. Um, he has a stomach disorder, maybe he has ulcers. But you know, where does this all come from? And I think it's partly due to his leadership style. This is a man who lives with the troops. He sleeps often in cold, or very hot conditions. He doesn't eat well. He doesn't look after himself. He feels as though he's always got to be at the decisive point, wherever that might be. He's traveling by day and by night. The man is exhausted. And I, I'm sure that that exhaustion showed itself in a chronic medical problem that he had. And he has problems with his stomach since the First World War. And he falls ill with those same stomach problems in the Second World War. Patton enters into the North African conflict with the American forces, Operation Torch, landing in Morocco. What's important here is that Patton will eventually take over an armored, the Second Corps, I believe, after it fails at the Kasserine Pass. And he will become an inspiration to his men. He makes speeches which are strangely theatrical, strangely. He talks about men of Mars. They talk about crazy Patton. Uh, he's seen as swashbuckling, he makes speeches rather saying, I'd rather dead heroes than live cowards. All very odd here in the 21st century. And yet he is successful on the battlefield, though not against Rommel. Rommel has been invalided home. So Patton's success in North Africa is limited. Montgomery has the big success. Immediately after the conclusion of the hostilities in 43, they began planning to execute Operation Husky. Montgomery is now well regarded by his commanders and given the task of overall command of Operation Husky. It's going to be his plan again. He's going to land with the 8th Army on the eastern side of Sicily. Patton is going to land with the 7th Army on the south side. And there's not much for Patton to do because it's, it's the 8th Army that's going to go up the coast road and capture the capital. Is this the first of the rivalry between these two men and who gets the better of it at this point? Well, interestingly, the two men had met very briefly at a conference uh, prior to this, and neither man was particularly impressed with the other. I think there was um, quite a lot of rivalry between the two just because of their personalities. And this really now comes to the fore. 
Montgomery, as you say, the experienced general who has seen action since 1940, and Patton fighting with a new American army trying to find its feet, um, didn't like taking second best, didn't like to be on the flank of the Brit, quite understandably uh, felt that um, he was being ill used. And so this was just a rivalry that was made out of the circumstances of the day. What is striking in the professor's book is if this was Shakespeare, we would say, oh, well, that's the art of a dramatist, you know, to arrange things. So we introduce our characters over the scale of their lives and they meet once and twice and they're all preparing for a future they can't know. But we're about to enter the main con the main contest itself, the battle for the civilization in the 20th century, because we're going off to Operation Overlord and we're going to start in a strange place. We're going to start at St. Paul's School, where Bernard Montgomery began his education. The book is The Commanders, The Leadership Journey of George Patton, Bernard Montgomery, and Erwin Rommel. Lloyd Clark is the author. It is now the spring of 1944. Bernard Montgomery is rewarded with overall command of the ground forces on D-Day, the crossing of the Channel, the invasion of France. He is to command the 21st Army Group. He's in charge of the landing itself. He's been inspirational to his own men, but to his peers, Eisenhower and the other commanders from the American side and the British side, he's irritating. He, he creates friction. He doesn't care what you think of his opinion. And we're going to go to a lecture, the lecture of lectures he gives in his life. This is at St. Paul's School in May of 1944. He's given this presentation in April, but now, this morning, Winston Churchill, the prime minister, is present. And the professor gives us the detail that Bernard Montgomery lays out a map on the floor, and he's going to tell them how he's going to conquer first the, the Army Group B, commanded by Erwin Rommel on the coast of France. And then he's going to conquer France and the, and, the, and the German army. And then he's going all the way to Berlin. Professor, this is a scene that you can't make up. Here it is. Bernard Montgomery giving the lecture of his life. What is the memory of the men uh, who were in that room? Was he persuasive? Was he mesmerizing? Did he mumble? What, did, they have, did they write it in their memoirs? He was scintillating in May 1944. This is the man who had been presented with a plan that he said was not good enough, that was full of holes. He reinvented the overlord plan and he took ownership of it. And this was his presentation of the Montgomery plan. And he was absolutely at the center of it. And it was not just the way that he presented it, with great confidence. It was the way in which nobody left that room thinking it would not work. He was a master of the detail. He was a master of the strategy. Men like Winston Churchill were mesmerized by this performance. And it's very rare that one reads diaries of, of veteran staff officers and finds the names of lecturers emboldened in those pages. But when you look at the staff officers that were present um, at that May briefing, everyone talks about Montgomery's performance. It was remarkable. He knows he's going up against Rommel. He knows that he defeated him in the desert or forces for him defeated the Germans and the Italians uh, simultaneously. He knows that the Germans believe that he's coming, but they don't at this point have confidence that it's going to be Normandy or Pas de Calais or even the speculation on the south of France, that's still unknown to the Germans. Is that correct, Professor? That is, that is correct. The Pas de Calais would just be a 20 mile crossing, but the um, attack towards Normandy would be a far greater distance and therefore at far greater risk. Uh, but Montgomery recognizes that the allies have far greater physical resources than the Germans. Rommel has already been defeated once in North Africa. He's very confident that he can do it all over again. He's crossing on D-Day and Rommel, uh, Rommel is the Army Group B on the coast of France. Montgomery is crossing with the invasion force on the 50 mile wide front. The landings go according to plan, except for the 
glitch in Omaha that is eventually corrected by hard fighting. However, Bernard Montgomery is given the important detail of capturing Caen, which doesn't fall for many weeks. And there is criticism afterwards, and perhaps at the time, that the British were bogged down. The detail here, Professor, is that the forces with Montgomery and the 21st Army Group, the British forces, had been fighting since North Africa, whereas the American forces were generally fresh, to my understanding. The 1st Division was there, but the 29th Division on Omaha was a fresh division, and the Americans had a manpower pool that vastly outweighed the British manpower pool. Did Montgomery recognize that he was asking over much of men who were exhausted by the battles? I think that you put your finger on a very important point. Because Montgomery had the work ethic that he had, he would work all hours, but he would also get enough sleep. He would look after his health. I think that he had a, a feeling that everybody else was in an equally sound physical and mental shape, but that, that wasn't true of his troops. He was asking a huge amount of them, perhaps beyond what they could deliver. And Montgomery had given them objectives that were perhaps beyond their means at this time in the war. And himself, he wouldn't ever accept that it was beyond the possibility for his troops to take the objectives he set them. And therefore there is some contradiction between what he asked his troops to do, the objectives he set, and then what he said afterwards when they failed to achieve them. And this led to an increasingly bad relationship between Montgomery, Eisenhower, and the American generals. Yes, in September, they've moved, uh, they've captured uh, Paris, and they've moved on to moving into Germany, a uh, Belgium and Germany. And the very well-known re- well Operation Market Garden. This is Montgomery's plan to end the war by Christmas. It's a dash across into the Ruhr Valley to cut off the Germans. It, is, it involves airborne, which is highly risky. It involves an armor 30 Corps to advance in a very narrow path over three bridges. It's, re- it's celebrated as the bridge too far. Montgomery, however, drives this plan on Eisenhower. Afterwards, does Montgomery acknowledge that it, that it was a flawed, Professor? No, he said that because the uh, British forces got 90% of the way up to crossing the Rhine, it was 90% successful, but that just wasn't the case. They failed to achieve their objective. And if I could just reflect for a moment on the fact that this was the only battle since the Battle of Normandy where Freddy de Guingan, his very loyal and capable chief of staff, wasn't present. Um, Freddy de Guingan had been sent back to the United Kingdom because of the, he was in a state of nervous exhaustion. And um, I can understand why, working with Bernard Montgomery. And he wasn't there to say, General, I think that this plan is too much of a risk. It shouldn't go ahead. And because Freddy wasn't there, Montgomery didn't have that checks and balances system and so went ahead anyway. The result was a failure. For Rommel, the war is short at this point because the D-Day invasion comes as he worried about it since he took over the defenses of northern France. And on the 12th, he recognized that he was outgunned and outmanned and outmaneuvered and a withdrawal was necessary or perhaps more. On the 17th of June, Hitler makes his only visit to the front. And this relationship is now to be strained to the breaking point because Rommel presents to the Fuhrer that the war is over for us. It's time to negotiate with the Americans and the Brits in the West, and we'll all go on fighting with the Russians, the Soviets, the communist threat that Hitler had used to rise to power. Hitler rejects him, but what a risk, Professor. Erwin Rommel going up against the Fuhrer and telling him what to do. Absolutely. What leaders must have is moral courage. And I think all the three leaders that we're talking about had that in bucketfuls. And there's no better illustration than Rommel standing up against Hitler during the Battle of Normandy. And not for the first time, he stood up against him many times in North Africa and saying, what are you doing? We don't have the resources. We need to cut our losses now. Let's try to, to make peace. The fact that Hitler wouldn't begin to think about peace negotiations was to um, Rommel 
not only unprofessional, it was unthinking and callous. And he never forgave him for that. Again, chief of staff. Rommel's chief of staff is a man named Gauze. Gauze, I hope I pronounce it correctly. And Frau Gauze has lived with Lucy back in Germany, except Lucy demands that Frau Gauze leave. They have a bad relationship. And so not only does Frau Gauze leave Rommel's home, but also Gauze leaves his staff and he's replaced by a man named Speidel. Speidel is an honorable uh, German soldier. At the same time, he's involved in the Operation Valkyrie, which is the army plan to remove Hitler. And they look to Rommel as a possible leader after Hitler is dead or imprisoned in some fashion. Your measure, Professor, you've seen all this material and it's been argued now for 70, 80 years. Did Rommel know what Speidel was talking about when they spoke of the, the Fuhrer's bad leadership? I think it's inconceivable that a field marshal um, who was close to the regime did not have an inkling that there were moves afoot to replace Hitler with somebody else. What I think that is quite clear, however, is that Rommel was not at the heart of those deliberations. He was not one of the great planners. He was at best on the periphery. I've no doubt that had um, Valkyrie succeeded, then Rommel could well have taken up a position of considerable power within the new regime. But that is not what he was fighting for at this point. He was still at heart a German military professional who would stay loyal to the bitter end to his Fuhrer. The assassination failed. Nearly 5,000 were arrested and executed or in some fashion brutalized. Uh, Rommel was given a choice. You either go on trial and we'll hang you or you commit suicide. He chose suicide to protect his family and his son. He's gone. However, we must attend to Patton because Patton is celebrated for what he is given a chance to do, which is to dash, something that his cavalry tactics taught him. Uh, he's given Third Army, he's told to attack South, and then finally he's told to attack East and to close the fillet's pocket. He's running, outrunning his supplies. And the complaint he will make repeatedly is, if you give me the supplies, I'll get to Berlin. I'm going to be the first to Berlin. Is it accurate, Professor? Would adequate gasoline have made a difference? There's no, there's no doubt that during that period in the breakout, there was just a lack of resources ac across the front. And we see Operation Market Garden being Montgomery's attempt to gain resources to make his own dash. Patton was making his own um, arguments for his area, his third army to be given preference. And of course, it was Eisenhower's job to keep these allies together, to bring um, cooperation across the front. So we have two of the characters in this book, Patton and Montgomery, wanting to, if you like, win the war themselves, which no way could they have done. And Eisenhower being the man that tried to keep a broad front, keep everyone moving slowly but surely ahead, but critically for post-war Europe, keeping them together. No one nation winning the war for themselves. Hitler plans uh, an offensive in winter. Watch on the Rhine, Operation Watch on the Rhine in English. It's launched, we call it the Battle of the Bulge. It's launched in the Ardennes Forest in conditions that the Air Force can't fly in. And the newly 106th Division for Hodges is surrounded and destroyed by the German advance, which is uh, several hundred thousand men and at least two major panzer divisions. Uh, Patton has anticipated this could happen and has prepared the plans to to turn his his army north ninety degrees and and reach the flanks of the German advance. It's amazing that he did this. Now the trick here is that the people were trained to do it in in severe conditions. And did Patton then at that point get the consideration of his peers who'd been disdaining him as a show off that he'd, that he'd done his homework? What did they think of him when he reached Bastogne? I think that they'd underestimated their great armored warfare general. Uh, we've said that perhaps uh, in North Africa, his troops didn't connect with him, but you've now got a, a third army that are remarkably loyal 
to Patton. They will fight. They will die for this man. Although they perhaps thought he was a little bizarre, a little bit odd, he was their odd and awkward general, and they would do whatever they could to see him and their colleagues succeed. And therefore, it, it provided them with that impetus that you often find in the middle of a battle when colleagues say that something is impossible, that the humans, the teamwork, the collaboration create something that is remarkable. And therefore, what Patton achieved in the relief of Bastogne was not just a surprise to the Germans, it was a surprise to the Allies, uh, to Eisenhower, to Bradley, to Montgomery. It was his finest hour, no doubt. The book is The Commanders, The Leadership Journey of George Patton, Bernard Montgomery, and Erwin Rommel. We'll begin with Erwin Rommel only because he's executed as a traitor by Adolf Hitler. And what I learned about Erwin Rommel is that his wife, Lucy, never never relented on the idea that he was persecuted because he was successful and that he was not involved in the plot against Hitler. But then again, Lucy was looking at it from the point of view of a survivor of the Second War in Germany, which was a, a, dep a deprived land for many years afterwards, not until the Marshall Plan showed up in the late 40s did Germany stop starving. So I don't ask Lucy Rommel to have a an opinion that stands up in the 21st century. Professor, the fact that there was a plot against Hitler recommends all of these officers. Is there a moment you can see in what we have of the letters to Lucy or his memoirs where Rommel realized that he was working for the devil? I think that what we see increasingly is uh, Rommel recognizing that um, Hitler was a very flawed man, not necessarily as a leader or even as a politician, but as a, as a personality. His behavior traits were something that Rommel increasingly didn't like. If you add on to that the way that he seemed to be so callous with the lives of troops, he wouldn't listen to expert comment, including his own. I think by Normandy, we see in uh, Rommel's letters to Lucy that he's beginning to change his mind about um, Hitler and he's beginning to be a little um, less afraid of vocalizing and indeed writing to his wife about what his true feelings are. And uh, what we see therefore is a man who probably died because he was a great leader, whether he was involved in the plot integrally or not. He had to die because he was one of the few military officers that commanded the respect of the Wehrmacht at this point. George Patton, we've not emphasized incidents that became extremely difficult for Eisenhower, for Marshall, for the American media, for the president of the United States. The abuse of two soldiers during the Sicily campaign, really following the fact that Patton was loose with his abuse on troops. They, I believe there was an incident in the first war where he swung a shovel at a troop and, and he was threatening troops all the time, which is exceedingly unacceptable for, given the, the subordinate's inability to respond or defend himself. Uh, he also spoke loosely and poorly about allies. Uh, one instance in Britain, when he left out mentioning the Soviets who were integral to the success of the war. Patton was a man who was troubled when he was not at the center of the stage and not being celebrated. Professor, this is not the kind of leader that would inspire here in the 21st century. Is that, is that a fair generalization? No, I think you're absolutely right. These are behaviors that were in fact a trait of, of Patton from uh, relatively early in his military career, um, he was often abusive towards his subordinates, either verbally or physically. And we see, as you said, um, an illustration of this in the First World War when he nearly killed a man with a shovel who wouldn't get up under fire. He slaps two soldiers um, in Sicily. He was impetuous. He was hot headed. He was arrogant. And sometimes he didn't he couldn't control his behavior. Now, on one hand, that was a real problem for Eisenhower. What would he do? Or what would he say next? But I also believe that 
this sort of behavior trait was what also made him a great armored commander. He was a risk taker. He was impetuous. He would do things that were not normal and not expected. And therefore, it's difficult to actually take these behavior traits out of pattern the leader and pattern the commander. They were just an integral part of it. And finally, Bernard Montgomery celebrated, uh, advanced, and became critical to the defense of Europe against the uh, Soviet threat, the Western Union Defense Organization, NATO. He became deputy of the Supreme Allied Command in Europe, uh, died in 1976. And the professor has a lovely epitaph because Omar Bradley wrote a note. What was it? Just simply thanks. Is that is that correct, Professor? That was the note that Bradley said. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the two men um, had fallen out over memoirs after the war. There was a great battle of the memoirs. But there's no doubt that, once again, although Bradley might not have liked Montgomery, he had great respect for him, as everyone who encountered Montgomery did. And I think that the note that he left um, on the flowers that were placed on his grave just sums that feeling up perfectly. The book is The Commanders, The Leadership Journey of George Patton, Bernard Montgomery, and Erwin Rommel. Lloyd Clark is the author. I'm John Batchelor.